so to say this in terms of the copyright realm, a copyright originally in the 18th century was uh, a 14-year grant. If you still were alive, you could get 28 years. It was limited in time. It was limited in scope, too. It was just printed material where you could make a real copy. Uh, fast forward to the present, the term of copyright uh, for an individual such as myself is my life plus 70 years. So plausibly, it's well over a century. Uh, for a corporation, it's 95 years. And um, these are very long terms. They are statistically indistinguishable from a perpetual term. Right. So whereas in the early days, copyright was a clearly limited grant, a monopoly grant, uh, now it is a fairly unlimited monopoly grant. And also it covers a range of things that were never covered before. The simple example is... Um, it used to be the case that you had to ask for a copyright, register with the copyright office, put a mark on your book, and so forth. That's all been done away with. What are called formalities have disappeared. And now everything you m make in tangible form automatically is yours to own, should you care to do it. So if you take notes in a class, they are yours and copyrighted technically. So it's, a, it's expanded in terms of its length, and it's expanded in terms of what it covers. And this is plausibly a taking from the commons. That is to say, if copyright lasted, let's say, 50 years, after 50 years, everything falls into the public domain, which is a cultural commons. If you extend it another 20 years, you're taking things out of right. the cultural commons and giving them to private owners. Now, there's arguments on both sides of this, but, uh, but um, it's, it's been a real tipping point in the last um, few decades. A second example would be the way that the patent rights have been expanded. It always used to be the case that you could not patent something that you found in nature. Right. If you figured out, you know, what temperature water boils at, that was not something you could own. In recent years, we've allowed people to patent organisms that they find in uh, hot springs. Um, until there was a recent Supreme Court decision, you could patent uh, part of the human DNA information and... This is a change. That is to say, before about 1950, you couldn't, and now you can. And uh, with the DNA business, this went to the Supreme Court. And to explain what was at stake, uh, one company named Myriad owned the right to a piece of the human DNA associated with breast cancer. And therefore, they were able to charge higher prices for their test and limit other people making experiments around this. This is not in the public good. It, it's good if you're a stockholder of Myriad Corporation, right. but it's not, uh, it's not in the commons, which is where it should be. So, and maybe the last thing to say about the expansion of, um, uh, of the market into places where I hadn't thought of what might go before is that I feel there's a kind of new colonialism in which the United States is, uh, and the other uh, sort of high-tech countries are interested in making their rules of the road around uh, the ownership of art and ideas into the international rules of the road. Um, so one interesting thing is uh, the United States used to be a pirate nation. Yeah. For the first hundred years of our existence, we happily took all the books printed in Europe and gave them to American printers and let them print them without any permission asked or fees given back to European authors. And this is the case in general with intellectual property importing nations. They're happy to import yeah. and not pay fees. And we, we were happy to do so for 100 years. Now the shoe is on the other foot, and um, we would like to export our rules of the road to other countries. A simple example of a place we did that, after the invasion of Iraq, there was an interim authority that the United States set up. And before they left, they left uh, changes in the Iraqi uh, intellectual property laws that they would like to see enact, including things like copywriting uh, public performances of the Quran. <laughs> this th this is a bizarre change in the uh, in the cultural commons of an Islamic nation, um, and would be representative of a kind of um, po uh, neo-colonial exporting of the property rules of one nation into the rest of the world. And and I, I think what you've argued in common as air is that is that um, these efforts to uh, convert the commons into private property that 
can be marketed in, or sold in different ways, um, depletes the reservoir from which we all draw uh, for cultural production, for cultural sustenance, uh, that, that in fact, uh, sometimes under the rubric of protecting the author uh, or the creator, uh, what we have is an impoverishment of the reservoir from which we create new literature, new music, new practices. Yeah. yeah. So, you know, part of the assumption here is that to be a lively, creative person it helps to have a lively creative commons yes. around you. Yeah. And again, I should say briefly that I, I'm not opposed to a short-term copyright or short-term patent. I think these are very useful uh, tools of public policy. But the, uh, but the balance has been lost. And um, there are many situations in which the monopoly power that we give to um, the owners of cultural property has inhibited f further work. A simple example would be... Um, the estate of James Joyce. Uh, for some reason, James Joyce's grandfather, has, I mean grandson, has a grudge against uh, people who work on James Joyce. So he, he, for years, just forbade people to use the work and reprint it, and essentially squashed a whole series of, uh, of works. And um, uh, there are lots of cases like this, a kind of cultural aphasia in which if you get the right lawyer and are willing to spend the money and time, you can usually figure out how to say the thing you want to say, but in fact, between you and that stands a kind of permissions culture in which uh, money and people incentivized to be your enemies um, may prevent you from saying what you want to say. Yes. Well, I saw this uh, when I uh, curated this exhibition on Sigmund Freud and psychoanalysis years ago. Uh, we worked with the Freud estate and with the Freud Museum, but um, it's just what you described, this permissions culture uh, really limited our ability to use certain things uh, that I would have imagined in the public domain, even small clips of things that were very well known to, you know, uh, museum goers all over the world. Uh, suddenly, somebody arrived with a piece of paper saying, no, 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 you can't show 30 seconds of this movie or quote this song because um, it is not in the commons, it is ours. And uh, yeah. and that was a, it was a sobering experience, again, limiting our ability to, um, uh, to say something we wanted to say about the cultural importance, in this case, uh, of psychoanalysis. Uh, what do you think people can do uh, uh, to contribute to the re-energizing -energi of the commons, or what can people do uh, to contribute to the commons now in this, in this new regime? Well, I mean, I would say the first thing to do is to, to educate yourselves. I think it's a duty of current cultural citizenship yes. to know how this system works and what its problems are and so forth. So uh, awareness is the first step. Then um, uh, maybe two categories of uh, uh, pushback. One would be trying to work with the law, and the other would be trying to work with norms or customs or, or uh, um, principles of best practice. It's like, to give the law thing very quickly... Um, you know, in the U.S. Constitution, it says that the copyright and patent terms should be limited. So that's a legal expression of the fact that an unlimited copyright monopoly is not a good thing. And um, so we can get things written into law and have uh, tried to do so that would be um, useful um, uh, stinting of the commons. Uh, but another way to do it is, is to simply um, find practice communities and have them think about how does this work best for us. An example would be the people who work on um, the human genome and other genome projects um, got together once in Bermuda and came up with a set of ground rules for themselves called the Bermuda Principles. And uh, one piece of it, for example, is um, they agreed that at any research center, any place in the world, got to a certain level of description of a new piece of genetic information, they would post it on the World Wide Web within 24 hours. And there are computers internationally which consolidate all this data. So every morning, all over the world, all these scientists are working from the same uh, set of information. And this is not about the law at all. It's just about people saying, look, this is, we need a commons of our ideas if we're going to proceed with this kind of complicated uh, research. So um, 
thinking about norms and thinking about the law. The final thing I would say is that um, one thing about the traditional uh, embodied commons of Europe, such as woods and fields and streams and so forth, was that there was a custom called beating the bounds. And this meant that every year uh, in your village, uh, people would get together in springtime and they would have cakes and beer and, uh, you know, party favors and stuff. And, and they would walk around the village with uh, axes and mattocks and stuff. And if they found any place where people had encroached upon the commons, they'd tear it down. They would beat the bounds to make sure the commons was maintained. Yes. So I, would, I think we should think about also beating the bounds. I mean, to give a modern example of this, um, it is the case that uh, the entertainment industry, which has its own sense of how it should operate and make money and so forth, uh, often comes to colleges and universities and says, we'd like you to police your students and have them behave so that they uh, conform to our model of the world. And colleges and universities should resist this because, in fact, uh, the college and university sense of how knowledge circulates and what its purpose is is different from the, uh, the sense that they have in Hollywood. Uh, it's not that one is right and one is wrong. They are really just distinct. And uh, so if the Hollywood people come and say, we'd like to put a lot of software on your computer systems so that we're monitoring your kids at all times, the college should say, no, we have an edge between us and you, and it's important to maintain that edge. So... To save the commons, there's law, there's uh, customs and norms, but also we should beat the bounds. We should keep the edge. Yeah, keep the edge. It's a great, it's a way, great way of, of bringing this conversation to a close. I, I know here at Wesleyan, I have a colleague in, in uh, astronomy who uh, they too have this commons of, of uh, data every morning J, from JPL or other sources they get data from. The, moon, the Mars rover and other um, space probes, and all, everyone can work on this latest data. And, of course, in the arts, uh, people want to be able to draw uh, from um, a, a, a common uh, a set of um, uh, cultural reference points, uh, cultural production, uh, and, uh, and practices. Um, and I, I think... Uh, a class like the one we're preparing now is uh, it, its aim is to, as an experiment to see what happens when we share things we know as widely as possible for free. Um, you know, I have colleagues, uh, university presidents, who say to me, "Michael, you're you're going to you're killing the university because you know it's not free at the university, and we need to pay our professors, and we need to have property, uh, and we do." But I have found in this experiment, sharing with what we know with as many people as possible actually um, doesn't take away from um, our ability to make things uh, on campus or to, to write books and sell them or to make recordings and sell them. It actually uh, increases our ability to share ideas and uh, participate in a culture. Uh, and uh, keeping the edge uh, and beating the bounds is something we're, we're certainly going to continue to do. Thank you so much for joining us in this conversation, Lewis. It's been a pleasure to talk with you. Thank you. It's been fun to share all this. Thanks very much. Bye-bye. Bye-bye. There are cultural goods. There are um, social goods. The more, the more we share doesn't mean the less anybody will have. We want to be in situations where we can share in things without dimis- diminishing the quality of our individual experience or the quality of our collective experience, and without diminishing the resource itself, right? So when I listen to music and enjoy it, it doesn't mean there's less music to go around. If I bring too many cows to the pasture, there's less pasture to go around. How can we can make the pasture more like the music? How can we make our private enjoyments more social in our responsibility, in our pleasure, and in our thinking about their futures. That, that's one of the themes of this course. Now, in this course, we're not going to spend a lot of time philosophically musing about how to turn a private enjoyment into a public good. That's, that's, that's another kind of class. That's a, that's a class in political philosophy or a class in, um, in, in ethics. In our class, we're going to actually turn to some really... Uh, 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 seemingly intractable problems and try to understand 
how by thinking of them in social terms, thinking of them in cooperative terms, we might be able to deal with them more effectively. We start off with uh, poverty, especially in light of uh, aid and philanthropy. Extreme poverty is one of the great plagues on our planet. Um, and uh, many people think we have uh, made great strides in, in, uh, in dealing with it over the last decades, and we have set goals for the next few decades. What are the techniques we use to deal with extreme poverty that are most effective? How can we, by understanding those techniques more fully, support those kinds of organizations that are best able to eradicate or at least reduce the levels of extreme poverty? That's going to be the subject for next week, um, and I'm very much looking forward to working cooperatively <laughs> with you um, as we think about these major global challenges and then figure out a few things we can do um, to uh, address them and make a positive difference. See you next time.